Don't forget, you can reach the latest episode of Potomac Watch anytime. Just ask your smart speaker. Play the Opinion Potomac Watch podcast. From the Opinion pages of the Wall Street Journal, this is Potomac Watch. Welcome back. I'm Kim Strassel. I'm here with Mane Ukwebarua and Kate Batchelder Odell. So on Monday, we saw a joint attack. House Appropriations Chair Rosa DeLauro posted online letters that she'd received from nearly all the Biden cabinet heads and agency heads. And she had written to them back in January during the fight over whether Kevin McCarthy would become speaker. And according to reports at that time, one of the things McCarthy agreed to in order to secure votes was to agree to a budget that would return non-defense discretionary spending to fiscal 2022 levels. That would necessitate cutting about $130 million from non-defense discretionary spending from the most most recent levels that we got in the omnibus of late last year. So she asked these heads to detail what would happen, just how bad would it be if, heaven forfend, we had to go back to spending what we spent just one fiscal year ago. The White House also jumped in, is spending this week spelling out the coming doom. Kate, can you tell us about some of the horrors, at least according to Democrats, that will befall the nation if we have to go back to fiscal 2022 levels? <laughs> yes, we're back to the budget future where we have this brinksmanship about everything bad that's going to happen if we go with someone else's budget. And so some of the things that the Democrats are picking here, I have to admit, are quite hilarious. One of Deloro's first complaints is that the cuts would make our border less safe. I'm not sure how we'd be able to tell at this point, but she also lists it would take money out of the transportation industry, that it would harm education. I mean, there's a whole laundry list of subjects. But Kim, I think we need to focus on what's really going on here. The first is that domestic agencies have been getting double digit percentage plus ups for years. And Democrats also have been using COVID emergency bills to dump more money into domestic agencies. The run up in domestic spending over the past few years has been really significant. So the idea of going back to just 2022 levels is really not as big of a cut as they would like everybody to think. The second thing here, Kim, and this is kind of a classic in Washington, is to just pick the most painful things on the planet to cut so that you try to, you know, put the damage on your political opponents. In this case, you know, the Democrats are talking about, oh, we're going to shut down 125 air traffic control towers and strand people and make them even more angry at the airport. And we've seen in shutdowns past, you know, you shut down the national parks and cancel the family trip to Yellowstone and just try to make it as damaging as possible. It's really a, a skullduggery tactic here. So these are some of the things that they are trying to fan out. I think the cuts are really just much more modest than understood. And there is also would be a way to manage them without that kind of pain. Yes. Speaking of skullduggery, one of the little tricks that they used in these letters was to make the assumption that, in fact, the cuts would have to be much greater than 8 percent or $130 billion because Republicans intend to throw money at the defense budget and, and work to do that. They'd have to cut domestic non-defense discretionary budgets even more to pay for it. Of course, this isn't in any way a for sure thing. Some of us are actually concerned. Republicans won't put more money into the defense budget. But some of these letters relied on a fictional assumption that, you know, these agencies would be seeing these sweeping, striking budget cuts in order to make that transfer. Manet, the proximate cause of this attack is that earlier this month, the House Freedom Caucus, which is about 40 members of the Republican Party in the House, more on conservative fiscal side, they laid out their proposed budget, which did call for some pretty big changes in terms of clawing back money and cutting outlays. Let's listen to House Freedom Caucus Chair Scott Perry talk about that budget. To shrink Washington, we save money now by ending President Biden's $400 billion student loan, student, student loan bailout. We rescind all unobligated COVID-19 funds. We recoup the $80 billion in IRS expansion funds and we recoup billions of dollars of wasteful climate change spending in the so-called Inflation Reduction Act. And by finding every single dollar spent by Democrats that can be reclaimed for the American taxpayer. Doing this will lower dollar for dollar the amount needed for any increase in the debt ceiling. 
It's actually what families across America who find themselves overextended must do. So as noted, the House Freedom Caucus, it's a more conservative part of the caucus. So yes, this is a more sweeping proposal they laid out. But it's not the official Republican position. Republicans haven't put out their position. So, Manet, what's the White House up to? Why is it going after this one particular bill that isn't necessarily the expression of the Republican Party? What's it teeing up for? How does this play into the debt ceiling debate that's coming? Well, I think Joe Biden and Democrats here are playing a classic strategy of exaggerate the position of your opponent in order to make your own extreme position look a little bit more moderate in comparison. And so I think that if Americans took a close, hard look at the omnibus bill that Congress passed and President Biden signed last December and looked at the roughly 10% increase in a domestic non-defense discretionary spending, they would be appalled to see not only some of the waste in certain programs, but the overall level of increase. And the fact that, as Kate was saying, that's now being treated as a baseline that cannot be lowered under any circumstances shows how radical their own position is. And so they know that this is going to be a drawn out fight having to come to an agreement in order to get the debt ceiling increased. It's possible that some of their members are going to be open to making cuts, but they want to minimize the amount of actual painful reductions that they might have to approve in order to get a deal. And so it benefits them to exaggerate the position that Republicans have taken. As far as the Freedom Caucus proposal, I think that Scott Perry and the rest of his group among the House Republicans know that these budget fights are big opportunity to show off your priorities. They know as well as anyone that Democratic Senate and Democratic President are not going to enact some of these proposals, but they want Americans to know that they would like to claw back that $80 billion for the IRS, that they would like to prevent the student loan forgiveness proposal from becoming law. And so the question is, once Kevin McCarthy actually begins having the hard conversations with President Biden and with Chuck Schumer about what agreement they're going to strike to to get the debt ceiling increased. Are these House Republicans going to still stick to their ideal proposal that they released? Or are they going to be willing to allow a little bit more space to hopefully get a deal that will include significant cuts, but also has a chance of being approved by Democrats too? That is the question. When is this going to happen? And is it going to happen? Why do Republicans not have a position yet? You know, Kate, I remember when we were doing the speaker's fight, we got it over with, and it meant that Republicans said they were supposed to turn quickly to this debt ceiling fight because, you know, we're going to hit the debt ceiling sometime this summer. And at least in theory, the GOP plan is to say, if you want our votes to raise it, you, the White House, are going to have to agree to some of our spending reduction plans. But to go in there and have that leverage, first, you have to have a plan. And yet here we are, the statutory deadline for Congress passing a budget resolution is April 15th. McCarthy has already said he's going to blow by that. He's got a little bit of an excuse in that the president was months late submitting his own budget, which is supposed to come first. But it strikes me, Kate, that the real reason that there isn't a plan yet is because he still has a lot of problems. Fights over whether to touch entitlements, how deeply to cut, what to do about defense. And yet, Kate, correct me if I'm wrong, this attack by the White House seems to be a very vivid reminder that until and unless the GOP gets behind something, it's not going to have any leverage in this debt ceiling fight. Last word. No kidding, Kim. I mean, with a majority as thin as the Republican one, they have to pick their fight and show some discipline. I think there could be a couple of good ones for them, including we're sending the COVID money that hasn't been spent or the IRS money that is used to go after middle income earners and audits. There could be places for that where they could notch a couple wins and focus around a couple ideas where they could control spending. Instead, what we're seeing is sort of this 11th hour, a huge effort, for instance, oh, we're going to do huge reforms in the Defense Department. Now, I'd be all for military health care reform or selling the U.S. military golf courses, but those are multi-year efforts that take consensus building and a coalition to get through and get done. And so they really need to make their priorities clear and develop a budget resolution, or they're just going to keep taking fire from these positions that they don't actually hold, like the Freedom Caucus budget. Yes, notable that there hasn't been a lot of GOP response this week other than from the Freedom Caucus, because again, they don't yet have a plan. Thank you, Manet. Thank you, Kate. And thank you to our listeners. We want to remind you that we are here every day of the week. We'll be back tomorrow. You can email us at pwpodcast at wsj.com. If you like the show, please hit the subscribe button. <music>